Good morning, good morning, how are you? So last week we looked at uh, Romans 12, verse 1. Here's what it said. It said, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul urged us to present our bodies as living and holy sacrifices because of the mercies. And notice it's plural, because of the mercies that God has showed us. And when we looked into this verse a bit further, we understood that the word acceptable comes from the Greek root word for logical. So it's only logical and reasonable and acceptable that this form of worship, bringing our bodies to him as living sacrifices, is a good thing to do. And so this morning I want to dive into verse 2 and learn what we need to do. We want to understand the directions that we need to follow to become those holy and living sacrifices. And here's what it says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, the first thing to understand here is the Bible isn't a self-help book. We just don't go pick it off the shelf and begin to read it and turn into a Christian overnight just because we've read the book. I made the mistake myself of that long time ago, years and years ago when I first became a Christian, when I was baptized and I received the Holy Spirit. I was on fire, I couldn't wait. Uh, everybody told me I would receive a spiritual gift. Everybody said when I got that gift, I could go to work in his kingdom and I could do something for the Lord. And I was on fire, I was pumped, I was ready to go. So I went home, I picked up my Bible, I read through it, I read through it again, I read through it again, I read through it four times cover to cover, page to page, four times. I left out the begats. I left out a couple things in numbers. I didn't care how many camels somebody had. But pretty much I went through the Bible four times and nothing, nothing happened. I didn't receive a holy, I received the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know about a spiritual gift. I didn't understand that it took more than that, that it was a process, that this was a growing process. Reading the Bible is a great thing, don't get me wrong, but it's not a self-help book in that sense. We can't just read it and take off. It's a journey. I had enthusiasm, I had plenty of enthusiasm, but I didn't know where to channel it. I had plenty of will, plenty of desire, plenty of enthusiasm and hope, but I didn't know what to do with it all just by simply reading the Bible. This journey of ours, as you know, takes a lifetime. And that's what verse two is. This verse is our map. It's the directions on how to get to be that living sacrifice that he's after. And the first thing I see in it, it says, don't be conformed to the world. Actually, the word uh, and the root word of it means fashion. Don't be fashioned or don't be conformed to this world. Don't pattern ourselves after this world. Don't take on the styles of this world. Thankfully, we don't do that anymore as we've grown older. I remember as a kid wearing bell bottoms. That was kind of silly, wasn't it? <laughs> but what it means is don't, don't look or behave. Don't act or think like those who do ungodly things, things that are acceptable in society, but they're not acceptable in God's kingdom. Behave according to what is good. Behave according to what is acceptable in his kingdom. And then he says we can, be, we can by doing this, we'll transform our minds. Our minds will change. And that word transform is a pretty cool word because it was the same word that was used in the transfiguration. Do you remember that? When Jesus appeared in his glory on that mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah were there, and they wanted to build them a hut and have a meal with them. But it's the same word that Jesus transformed into his glory, which means someday we will be and made in his image, we will be transformed in that same glory now. But what he's saying now is do this. You worry about transforming your mind, I'll transform your bodies when the time comes. You transform your minds while you're here on earth. You transform your mind so that you can serve me and understand and prove my will, which really means test. Test my will. We need to look at everything differently if we're gonna do that. We need to put the world aside and look at things spiritually. Throw everything away from us and think spiritually and not think like the world does. There was a, a woman in a small town and she had 12 children. And one of them died tragic death. One of them died suddenly in a tragic death. 
And a lady moved into town, a couple, a family moved into town, a couple houses from them, and they heard the story about this lady having a lot of children, but they didn't know how many she had. They just heard the story in town that she had a lot of children. And as luck would have it, a couple days later, she met up with her in the grocery store. And so she went up to her and she said, I heard you're the lady with a lot of children. She said, how many children do you have? And you know what the lady did? She looked at her and she lowered her head and shook her head and she said, too few, not enough. Her mind had been transformed by her experience. Her mind had transformed. The world would have said, oh, she has 12 children or had 12 children. One has passed away, but now she has 11. But to the lady, she had too few, not enough. She was thinking completely differently from the world, completely opposite from what the world thought. And she will always feel that way. Once your mind begins to transform, it will always continue transforming and will always be trying to discern the will of God and to prove and test whether it is good and pleasing and acceptable and perfect. Ever wonder why we're having so much trouble today in the world? Ever wonder why you and I don't understand it? You ever watch the news and just shake your head and go like this? Just shake your head, what is going on? The problem is, is that we're transformed. We've been transformed, or our minds are transforming. We're in the process of transforming, and we don't see things the way the world sees them anymore. The world and everything it offers is completely foreign to us. It has nothing to do with our age. I thought maybe it was my age just because I'd never seen anything like this before. But it's not my age. It's because I think completely different than the world thinks. When we look at the world, we look at it and we see filth. We see a polluted environment, and our minds think toward heaven, a clean environment. We try to glorify everything we do. We try to glorify and magnify our Lord and Savior Jesus and everything and everything we do and say and think, but the world isn't like that at all. People in the world today have stopped doing what? Taking responsibility for their sin. That's what all of this is. One more brick in the wall. Just We've stopped taking responsibility for our sins. Our nation has turned our back on God and on Jesus. It's just another sign of the end times where people will fall away from the faith. It's just one more sign that we're getting closer. closer. The, the, the worldly, the sinners, the, the non-believers, they blame everybody for their sin except themselves. Have you ever heard one person on television say, well, we did this because we're sinners? We did this because we think this way because we're sinners. We do these things because we haven't accepted Jesus. No, they blame everybody and everything else, but we are transformed, our minds are transformed. Their lust and their sins of the world have corrupted and polluted their minds, and that's exactly where we are. Their hearts, like we said last week, were made of stone. They haven't given their heart to God. If they'd give that heart of stone to God, he'd throw it away and give them one made of flesh, wouldn't he? But they refuse to do that. Every day we get closer and closer to the kingdom of God and further and further away from the earthly kingdom, from the worldly kingdom. L look at our verse again. It says, it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That word prove again can also be test so that we can test what the will of God is. We can test and make sure it's good and acceptable and perfect. The thing that we have to do before we begin though is make sure we're on the same page with what will we're talking about because God has more than one will. God is a th has three persons and he has more than one will. Our will, we might say our will is our will. Well, God has his will too and one of them, the first will is his sovereign will. Have you heard of a sovereign will before? That's the very will of God. And John could be talking about that will here. Should we test and prove God's sovereign will? That's, that's his holy purpose. His will is eternal. We live under his sovereign rule. His sovereign rule started when he created the earth and it will never end. We're under his sovereign will right now. Everything he wants of us, he, he, he runs the world. He, everything he wants us to do, not, we have free will, but his sovereign will tells us and gives us his path and his plan. And it's his plan. He's God, it's his own will. I can't change his will, I can't test his will, I can't prove his will. It's not up to me to do that. And so he can't really 
to be talking about this because this will was created or came about at creation and it will never end now. For the rest of our lives, for all eternity, eternity we will live under God's sovereign will. Romans chapter 8 says, we learn that God causes all things to work together for those who love him and for those who have been called to his purpose. All things work together for his will to those who love him and have been called to his purpose. Remember Joseph's brothers? What did he do? He threw him into a pit, remember that? And they bloodied his coat and brought it back to his dad and said, your son is dead and his father believed them. And that was the end of the story, but it wasn't the end of God's sovereign will. God used that tragedy, if you will, and used that story for what? For his own glory and for his own purposes. And you know how it ended in the Bible, we find out later on, that was God's sovereign will. He turned a, he turned a tragedy into a miracle and brought the people out of the, and saved the, helped save the people from famine and, and destruction. So no matter how much we transform our minds, we'll never know God's sovereign will. That's his, if we could know his will, we'd be God. So the will that he is talking about here in verse two can't be tested or proved by mere mortals. We don't have that ability. The next will is God's perceptive will. Have you heard of that, his perceptive will? It's also known as his command will. It's his commandments he's talking about. It's his orders and his decrees and the commandments that he gives us. His will that we can understand. We can't understand his sovereign will, but this is a will we can understand. For instance, love one another like I have loved you. That's pretty easy to discern, isn't it? Love one another like I have loved you. Honor your mothers and fathers. Do this in remembrance of me. We did it this morning. We remembered him during our communion service. And the best place to discover this preceptive will is actually in the Gospels. It's throughout the entire Bible, but the best place, I think, to, to understand it and to, and to receive it is in the Gospels because Jesus Christ lets, tells us all about the Father's will and he adds his will into it too. But that can't be the will that Paul is talking about either in this verses, can it? Because we don't need to test it or prove it. Love one another as I have loved you. Does that need testing? Does that need proving? Honor your mother and father, does that need testing? Does that need proving? No. That will is known. That will is yes this and no this. Do this and live. Do this and die. So that can't be what he's talking about either. The third type of his will is his discerned will, the will that God directs our lives through the principles of the Bibles. And that's a pretty interesting will when you think about it. There's no clear directive on how we should handle things with this will. This will is kind of, we can, we can understand it, and we know it, and we can follow it just by reading his Bible. It's kind of involved, with, think of it this way, involving his will in the situations of our lives. Who should I marry? Where will I live? Who carries, uh, who, what, uh, what career should I pursue? What job should I have? Uh, we're on our own in a number of things, but if we read the Bible, we can discern his will, can't we? If we read the Bible, he says, he says don't, uh, don't be unequally yoked, as an example. Uh, you wouldn't want a job uh, working in an X-rated movie theater, as an example. And so we can, we can follow his will this way. It, nothing, it's not mentioned specifically, but we do find the principles to be able to discern his will in the Bible. We can find our way even though we may have questions. And that will is already available to us, so it can't be that. It can't be that will at all, because that's already available to us. So it's not God's sovereign will, it's not his perceptive will, and it's not his discerned will, because we have all of those, and we can follow those pretty easily. So it must be God's disposition. That's the fourth one. And disposition speaks of God's attitude. It's the attitude that God has for a lot of things, and he wants us to try to determine that, to determine that type of will. It tells us what's pleasing and what's not pleasing to God. We know, for instance, God, that God shows mercy, but we also know, on the other hand, that he shows judgment. Uh, one hand, he speaks, uh, pleasure. he speaks nicely and pleasurably about uh, confessed sinners who have come to him. On the other hand, he finds no pleasure in anybody that refuses and rejects him. Ephesians 5.10 says we should try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And the only way to do that is through that transformation of our mind back to verse 2. 
It's the only way that we can do that, is that transformation of our mind. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And how do we do that? Well, the only way we can do that is with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't receive God's will. You can't know God's will. You can't understand it and, and bring it into your house and bring it into your lives and use it. We can't rely on our will because it interferes with his will. So we can never rely on our will, but we can rely on the Holy Spirit's will, right? Why? Because it's God's will. If, we, if the Spirit is speaking to us, if the Spirit is leading us, if the Spirit is guiding us, then we can follow that will because it's nothing more than God's will. The guidance that we receive from the Holy Spirit is, should be what we follow. In the book of um, Acts, uh, Paul is uh, traveling with Timothy. You mentioned it this morning. <laughs> uh, and they passed through a certain area, and as they were passing through the area, Paul got this feeling that they shouldn't go any further. He had a feeling that the Holy Spirit was stopping him. And so they stopped for the day and they fell asleep that night. And when he was sleeping during the night, he got a vision of a man standing there and pointing toward Macedonia and telling him, go there. And so they got up the next morning and they preached in Macedonia. And that's how he transformed his mind. That's how he discerned God's will by the transforming of his mind. John Piper said this, I like this. He said, most of the decisions we make are not spelled out specifically in the Bible. Discernment is how we follow God's leading through the process of applying spiritually sensitive biblical truth to the particularities of our situations. Whenever we get into a situation and we don't know to handle it, we don't know what to do about it, stop and check. Transform your mind. Think of the Holy Spirit and he will lead you in those decisions. And that's the will of God that we need to test and prove because we have to make sure what? That we're listening to the Holy Spirit and not to Ray Westman or not to yourself. Make sure like Paul did that you have that direction from the Spirit. And he says transform your minds first so that you will know. It's not this doesn't come afterwards. You won't know the will of God like the people today that have fallen away from him don't know God's will. You won't know it until you do begin that transformation process in your mind. When we first started uh, this transformation process, people noticed something differently, didn't they, about you? They noticed maybe you acted a little differently or held yourself a little differently and, and differently. And if our transformation is noticed on the outside, I've discovered that it's huge on the inside. It's like a little seed inside you that's growing and growing and growing and you feel it in here and you read your Bible four times over and sit there and think everything's fine, I'm a Christian, give me my spirit, give me my gift right now. But it takes a while for that to bloom on the outside and the people can see it on the outside. Then they know that you're saved and then they know that you are discerning his will through the spirit. I'm walking around, here's an example, I'm walking around and walking down the aisle here and I have a cup of coffee in my, uh, in my arm, my hand, and somebody bumps into me, hits my shoulder and bumps into me. Be careful, Mike. Somebody hits me in, <laughs> on my shoulder and what comes out of the coffee cup? Coffee, right? Why? Because it's the nature of the cup. By nature, the coffee cup holds coffee. And when you bump into me, if coffee comes out, it should. That's the cup's nature. What if I'm walking down through the aisle here and somebody bumps into me? In other words, what if they come up to me and accuse me of something? You said this, or you did that, or why did you do this? They bump into me that way. What comes out of me is my nature. If I get upset, if I'm angry, if I say, I didn't do that, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, what are you saying? Well, that's my nature. And that was my nature before I received the Holy Spirit, but now my nature is, well, let's talk about this. Are you sure? What, 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 let's sit down and, fight and figure it out. My mind has been transformed, and so it shows through my body, it shows through my actions, it shows through every part of me. You can't hide something that's growing like that inside you. So quickly, before we end here, um, we can transform our minds through reading the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Read the Bible, study the Bible like you do. Continue to ask for His guidance. Continue to ask the Lord to transform your mind. Continue to be in touch with the Holy Spirit. Before we act, act listen to the Spirit and ask. 
Sometimes the best thing to do is just ask a question. Is what I'm doing consistent, Lord, with what you say? Is what I'm about to do now consistent with your word? Is what I'm thinking about right now, is this what you would want me to think about? Is what this is happening in my life right now, how would you handle this situation in my, in my life? And that's how we transform our minds. That's how we change them from looking at the world to looking into the kingdom. I've been trying to teach Sherry directions for 45 years. <laughs> 45 years I've been driving down the road and I'd say, Sherry, what direction are we heading? And I expect her to say east because we're heading toward Daytona. Well, we're not far from the paddock mall. Want to stop in? <laughs> I turn around and head back the other way. What direction are we out? heading into now? We're heading west. Hey. We're going over toward Avon Nails. Want to get a pedicure? <laughs> she has no clue about worldly directions. Not a clue. If you ever gave her a compass in the middle of the woods and set her up with some, she, she would go in circles all day long. But she does know one thing. She has a transformed mind. She's been in the spirit and with the spirit since she was just a little girl. I kid her and say, if I go back to the Baptist church where you were brought up in Newport, Vermont, we could go downstairs in the nursery and I'd see her teeth marks in the crib. She's been there that long. And so she's traveled around the city of Newport or the county of Marion County here for 21 years. And she doesn't rely on worldly directions to get her find, to find her way around. She relies on landmarks. And that's what this is. These are landmarks that we look at. She knows where she's going because she knows where the mall is. She knows where the nail place is. She knows where these stores are. And that's what happens to us. We give away the worldly directions. We don't even bother to follow them anymore. We could care less what direction the world wants us to go in. What the direction we're looking for is his direction. And we allow him to change our minds. And every time he does transform our minds a little bit, that's a landmark, that's a landmark, that's a landmark and we get to know them. So I'll, I'll stop teasing you about directions. How's that? <laughs> if you're a believer, that's where we are today. We're, we're growing in the Word of God. We're, we're transforming our minds. It'll never stop. You have received the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have received the Holy Spirit, and you have received a spiritual gift by now. Many of you, maybe some of you are still, still reading your Bible and waiting, and it'll happen. He'll send you that gift when he's ready. But in the meantime, that's how we can transform our minds. Transform our minds and prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect so that we can become those living sacrifices that we talked of last week. You have the map, you have the directions, you're on the right path, and that's the way to become a living sacrifice. Amen? Let's pray.